series today called Spirit-Filled Families. And uh, as I was praying and asking God, God, which direction do you want me to go? He laid it on my heart heavy for this four-part series. On And, and, and really, honestly, this whole four, four-part series is because God sees the hearts of the mothers in this church. So that's why we're doing this. We're not doing it because I'm trying to make moms happy. I only got one mother that I'm really making sure that I make happy. That's the mother of my two daughters. I I thank God that I already make my my mom, who's 87 years old, I already make her happy. So, your God wants to let you know, mom and grandma. Oh, by the way, my two daughters are grown, but I'm still their dad, and I'm still training them and telling them, and at times getting in their Kool-Aid, whether they want me there or not, because I'll never stop being their dad. But tell you the truth, I have more fun being their children's papa than, okay, we won't go there either. (laughs) I don't want you to be uh, confused in the phrase that we're using, spirit-filled. Um. And in Pentecostal circles, there's some confusion in that. Extreme Pentecostals uh, believe that you're not spirit-filled unless you speak in tongues. Uh, Others, the more uh, mainstream, believe that you are spirit-filled. The problem is, with being filled with anything, we leak. Today, after this service, I'm going to go to lunch. I'm going to make sure that I'm filled. But tomorrow, I can guarantee you, I'll be hungry again. Somebody say amen. So I'm going to take the verse Ephesians 5, 15 through 18 to help us understand what we mean by, no, not what we mean, not what I mean, what the word means when he uses the phrase spirit-filled, when God uses the phrase, phrase spirit fills Ephesians 5 15 through 18 says this act like people with good sense not like fools hmm these are evil times oh boy so make every minute count I didn't see this verse 17 so don't get mad at me but I'm gonna say it don't be stupid (laughs) instead Find out what the Lord wants you to do. Don't destroy yourself by getting drunk. Here it comes. But let the Spirit fill your life. So according to Paul's uh, um, preaching or, or, or writing, I should say, in Ephesians, there's some key things here that become evidence that we're Spirit filled. A spirit-filled person doesn't do foolish things. If you're spirit-filled, you're going to act like people with good sense. Somebody say amen. If you're spirit-filled, you won't do the dumb things you did back in the day. Raise your hand if you ever did anything stupid back in the day. Raise your other hand if you didn't learn from that. Okay. (laughs) Now let's just praise the Lord because he saved us. Okay, okay. Find out what the Lord's A spirit-filled person takes time to know what God wants them to do. Are you hearing what the Spirit's saying? Now there's a contrast in verse 18, being filled with something that will intoxicate you or being filled with something that God gives you. In other words, there's two forces fighting against each other. We need to be filled with the Spirit of God and stay away from being intoxicated by whatever intoxicates you. could be wine in this case. In one version it says, do not be drunk with wine. I like this version because... If you constantly are getting drunk, you'll eventually destroy your life. Do we all agree with that? 
Okay. But here's the word about filled. But it says, but let the Spirit fill your life. The word in the Greek literally means to cram. You ever try to get something and you're just trying to cram it in there, get all you can in into whatever that means. I did that yesterday at, at uh, um, John's Incredible Pizza. We were over there for lunch, and I said, uh, I want an ice cream. And then we went to the ice cream machine, and Michelle stepped in front of me. But I'm a gentleman, and I let her have, get ice cream first. Then it was my turn, and I tried to cram all I could of that chocolate ice cream into Am I the only one that does that? Come on. You're looking at me like I'm just, what a crowd, what a crowd. You guys are tough, man. It means, literally means to cram, to fill up, to satisfy. It means to be complete. So when we're filled with the Spirit, we will be satisfied with what the Spirit does. We'll be complete in our lives and in our attitudes, in our hearts. We need to be completely filled with Jesus. And because we're completely filled with Jesus, there's an attitude of joy that's in our life. There's an attitude of thanksgiving that comes out of our life. There's an attitude of gratitude that flows from our hearts. So I want every parent and every grandparent in this place to be filled Filled with the Spirit because it's going to benefit you and benefit your family. So here we go. Are you ready? Father, thank you for this message. Thank you for these four points that I want to make this morning. May it change our lives and give us a deeper perspective on what you're doing and that we may be the parents and grandparents that are filled with your Spirit. And because of that, our children and our grandchildren our families will be benefited. In Jesus' name, amen. Number one, spirit-filled parents must respect each other. Spirit-filled parents must respect each other. Now, in this society today, respect is not valued like it used to be back in the day. We need to learn to respect each other. But I, I, I realize this. I realize this. I'm speaking to some blended families. And I respect that. I respect the fact that some of us, we weren't, unfortunately, uh, a lot of times families just, they break apart. I don't want to get into that. That's not the important thing. The important thing is not what happened in the past. The important thing is what we're doing about the future. That's what this is about. This is about the future. So, so please, don't be offended if, if, if what, with what I say to those of you that have a blended families. Bottom line is this. You need to respect everyone that's involved in your child's life. Did you hear what I just said? You need to respect everyone that's involved in your child's life. So that may be your wife's daughter, but it's but you're not the biological father, or the other the other side. That may be uh, your son, but it's not your wife's biological son. Nevertheless, you must respect everyone involved. Everyone involved. Well, you don't understand, Pastor David, what she did to me and how she treated me, or you don't understand, Pastor David, what what. Uh, he did to me and how he cheated on me. I understand the pain. I understand the sorrow. But I understand that we serve a God that is greater than your pain. God that is greater than your sorrow. God is greater than your hurt. When you guys came forward, when I, uh, when I heard God say, call them forward to leave their, power, their sorrow, you don't understand what happened. As soon as those of you that got real and said, I'm going to come forward, the presence of God intensified. The presence of the level of His presence, rose, the glory rose up. Maybe you didn't sense it, maybe you didn't feel it, but I sure did. I go, wow. I mean, it was almost like it pushed me back, God's presence, because you responded. 
And the same thing will happen. God's presence will intensify in your relationship with your children and even with your ex. You may not like what I'm going to say next, but it's the truth. you got to believe this. God loves your ex. God loves your ex. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. He's even teaching us, love our enemies. Love those who persecute us. So learn to respect them, even if they don't deserve, in your opinion, they don't deserve respect, doesn't let you off the hook. There's a lot of people that I show respect that I may not, I shouldn't put it that way, huh? Show respect, even though you don't think they deserve respect. Because when you do that, you show them Jesus in you. And isn't that what it's all about? Here's the deal. Now for those of you that are together and you're raising your children together, I got a word for you. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 through uh, 7. Actually, we're going to do verse 1 and 2. Then we're going to jump down, jump down to verse 7. All right? Wives, if you're a wife, you must put your husband first. Even if he opposes our message, you will win him over by what you do. No one else will have to say anything to him. The re this is the contemporary English version, and the reason I put this picked this version is because of this. You must put your husband first. Let me help you. The best thing you can do for your children, and if you're married and that's not their biological father, the best thing that you can do is put him first. Because when you do that, you build a stability in the home. Children need stability in the home. They need to understand everyone's place in the family. And if there is no respect towards your husband because he's not the father of your children and you put them higher than he is on your list, you are causing that family to be unstable. And you're actually causing harm to your children. So keep him first, even if he doesn't deserve it. Listen to this statement. Nothing builds more stability in the home than a solid biblical marriage. This is not about being fair. We know it's, life's not fair. This is about being biblical. Because you know God comes in and does stuff when we do his work. You show your children that you love the man of the house, the husband, your husband. You're going to help them learn how to love their husband or their wife. Verse 2, sisters. Because he will see how you honor God and live a pure life. That's bottom line. Moms, don't you want to honor God and let your children see it? Grandma, don't you want to honor God and let your grandchildren see that? Sisters, if your marriage is struggling and nothing you've tried is working, it's time to try God's work. God's way. Amen? Now for the husbands. And all the sisters said, about time. Here we go. Now the husbands. Verse 7. 
If you are a husband, you should be thoughtful of your wife. You should be thoughtful of your wife. In other words, you should be thinking about your wife for a change. Ooh, did he say that? You should be thinking about your wife. And you should be treating her with honor, treating her right. Why is it, guys, that we get so involved in other things that we actually, we don't mean to do it, sisters. We unintentionally ignore you sometimes because we're men and we start thinking and, and, and we don't multitask very well. I know you women, oh, you can multitask. I hear it all the time. What are you doing, Michelle? I'm multitasking, boy. Just sit down and rest. <laughs> Uh, Daniel, hit delete. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But guys, we get distracted. We should not get distracted. We should make sure that our wives are the first thing that we think about. When there's a decision being made, we're going to see how does this decision I'm going to make affect her life. Because if you treat her right, those kids are going to see it. And they're going to treat her right. One thing, and I don't know if it was Davia or Leticia, but I blame both. <laughs> I did not, listen, husbands, I did not tolerate them arguing with their mom. We get in disagreements. They want to do something. She wants them to do something else. And before you know it, they're talking. And Michelle would sometimes, moms, you know you do this. You know you do this. You let it you slip, you let it go before you, you know, you're arguing back and forth. But when dad got home or dad saw what was going on, uh-uh, no, uh-uh. You're not going to disrespect your mom that way. I stop them. Whether they, whether I agreed with what Michelle was doing or not, no. Be thoughtful of your wife. Think about her. Love her. Show her. Build her up. Treat her right. Because she isn't as strong as you are. If you're a husband, you should be thoughtful of your wife. That's a nice way of putting you should make her first. First over your job, first over your finances, first over your entertainment, first over sports, first over your children. And even if she's not their biological mother. Treat her with honor. Because she isn't as strong as you are. And she shares with you in the gift of life. She's a believer. She's a daughter of the king. Look at this next part. Then nothing will stand in the way of your prayers. Men, it's time to be a man. Your relationship, listen. What does that mean there? Nothing will stand in the way of your prayers. This is what it means. It means if you're not thinking of your wife, if you're not thoughtful of her, if you're not honoring her, then God is not happy with the way you are treating his daughter. Oh, did you hear that? Did you get that? It's not a matter of how you're treating your wife. It's a matter of how you're treating his daughter. Some of us dads get that. Because we've had our daughters, our adult daughters, having guys in their life that we'd like to remove them in any way possible. Listen, men, your relationship with your wife is more important than anything else. If you keep messing on, messing up with her and not taking her right, God's going to hinder your prayers. God's not going to listen to your prayers. It's priority. You want, you want to be blessed? Take care of your woman, then, he'll, then you'll be blessed. Tell you what the Word of God says. Besides that, all the strife between husband and wife has a very negative effect on the children. Do you agree? 
Do you understand that? So we want that to be changed. Somebody say amen. All right. So number one, spirit-filled parents must respect each other. Number two, spirit-filled parents do all they can to prepare their children for the future. Now, I'm dropping this one in here really quickly because I'm going to do an entire message on this uh, point of having teaching your children to be prepared for the future. But I just want to mention it real quick. Proverbs 22, verse 6 through 4. A lot of us know what 22, Proverbs 22, 6 is, but we need to see a little bit before uh, we get to that train up the child verse. All right, here we go. Verse 4. Humility and the fear of of the Lord bring wealth and honor and life. Humility and the fear of the Lord. In other words, if you teach your children to be humble before the Lord, if you teach your children to fear the Lord, show a reverence to the, to the Lord, you're actually teaching them how to succeed in life. If there's no fear of the Lord, if there's no respect of the Lord, if there's no love of the Lord, then you're actually teaching them how to rebel against God. And I don't care how much money they make, if they're rebelling against God, that money will never satisfy them. There's so much more to success in life than a nice car and a big house. I'm not against a nice car. I wish I had one. I'm not against a big house. I don't want a big house because that's just me and Michelle. Be hard to find her, but <laughs> so I like my little house. That's cool, but there's more important things. There's more important things. But prepare them for success by showing them humility before the Lord and teaching them to fear the Lord. Verse five: In the paths of the wicked lie thorns and snares. But he who guards his soul will stay far from them. What is that verse talking about? Let them know what's going to ruin their lives. Let them know what can destroy them. Tell them, talk to them honestly. Talk to them honestly about drug abuse. Talk to them honestly about anything else that you know that's going to harm them. Talk, talk to them about doing their homework. Because the, the way... A society is structured, they need a good education. Um, to get a good job and, and to succeed, yeah. They need to learn what hard work is. But they also need to learn that if they're not willing to work for it, they ain't going to get it. Somebody say amen, or oh man, one of the two. Don't spoil the children. Teach them to work. And then here comes the more uh, traditional verse that everyone knows, verse 6. This is the amplified version. Train up a child in the way he should go and in keeping with his individual gift or bent. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, I can guarantee you, every child, when she, he or she hits those teenage years, they will rebel in some way or another. That's not true. Yes, it is. You rebelled. Some of you rebelled in your teenage years and in your late teens and in your 20s and in your late 20s. And in you. Should we stop now? Should we keep on going? Some of you are in your 40s and 50s and you're still rebelling. We'll stop. That's enough. Train them. Train them about the word. Teach them about the word and then believe that what you planted in them in a young age will pop up and show up later in their lives. That's awesome. But this, there's another thing. The reason I picked this verse is this. In keeping with his individual gift or bent. In other words, take a good look at your son. Take a good look at your daughter. And according to their personality, according to their gifts and abilities, send them forward that way. Now, I'm a retired music teacher. I, I love playing music. Uh, that was my career. I would have loved for my daughters to follow me in that career. 
would have been great for them to go to college and, and be um, music teachers right now. They didn't want to. That's okay. I didn't try to force them to be what I wanted them to be. I looked at their lives and I let them develop their personalities and move forward in, in there. Right now, I'm so proud of my youngest daughter. She is just nailing it at her job and, and her, her, her um, immediate supervisor, which is actually grew up across the street from us back in the day. She just raves about Davi and how, what a great job she's doing. And, and uh, she's getting all these kind of benefits. What does Davia do sometimes? She jumps in the boss's Corvette and they go to Visalia. Shoot. I can't. You know what they call my car? What the grandchildren call my car? My, my mom's little Kia? Do you know what they call it? They call it the death trap. That's what I get to drive in. Come on, go with Papa in the death trap. <laughs> But I'm so proud of both my daughters. I let them develop in their personality and succeed in their gifting. Are you hearing? Don't force your kids. Invest in your kids. Find out their personality and the way that they should go. And when they're old, they'll be successful. Somebody say amen. All right. Number three. This is what I wanted to get to today. Really, number three. Ah, so I better hurry. Spirit-filled parents discipline their children according to the Bible. All right, so moms, here we go. According to the Bible, you dis- this is how you should discipline your children. Ephesians 6, 4. Now a word to you parents, so dads, let's, let's take, take a little bit of this for ourselves too. Don't keep on scolding and nagging your children. If I was back there with the kids, how many amens would I get? Okay, okay. Don't keep on scolding and nagging your children, making them angry and resentful. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. So however you're dealing with your child, make sure you're doing it according to God's word. Nagging and, and, and griping and complaining and scolding and always constantly being angry doesn't change a child. Loving discipline and direction changes a child. All right, here we go. For dads? Colossians 3.21. Fathers, do not nag your children. If you're looking at a new international version, it says exasperate. Don't wear out your child. Don't wear him out. Look at this. If you are too hard to please, they may want to stop trying. That's why I picked this version, that phrase, too hard to please. Sometimes we're, we're, we're on our kids. and we, we, yeah, I don't doubt your, your uh, desire to have what's best for your child, but I do challenge you to change the way you're trying to get them to this, this successful place in life. Don't be too hard to please. Don't be too so hard to please that they don't even want to try anymore. Why should I even try? He's not going to like it. He's going to be mad at me anyway. Even when I do good, he finds something wrong. Some of us do that, gentlemen. Tell the truth, some of us do it. So what we're going to do is we're going to do our best to encourage them. And when they do good, acknowledge it. When they're successful, let them know how proud you are of them. When they mess up, let them know they messed up, but you still love them. Because we don't want our children and our grandchildren to give up on life. Gosh, there's so many things going in my head. I, I, can't, I can't share it. But this is so important. We learn the biblical example on how to train and discipline our children, and we start doing it. Here's some ideas for you. How to discipline your child. Number one, start early. How early is early? All the way up front early. Waiting till they're five is too late. When they're old enough to know that they're getting in trouble, and even telling them that that's going to harm them. You know, teach them what know me. Even as an infant, 
one and a half, one with two, whatever. If you try to, to all of a sudden add discipline to their life when they're 14, hmm, come on now. Start as early as possible. Number two, this is so important. Realize each child is unique. Davia and Leticia, their sisters, they love each other, but they're different as night and day. So when I dealt with them, I dealt with them differently according to their unique personality. Some things would work with Davia that didn't work with Leticia and vice versa. So take time to know your child. Take time to know how you can to, to, to uh, how you can invest in them and correct them, and then make sure that it's biblical, and go for it. But number three, you have to be consistent. Find out what works, and then keep working it. Don't let, I even hate to put it this way because it sounds kind of harsh, but don't let them get away with anything. What do I mean by that? Do you confuse them if you punish them? Okay, here's an example. You want them to take their dish, they have a glass or whatever from the table, to the sink. Simple simple task. Take it. <laughs> I didn't mean to see that. Take that glass to the sink, that plate to the sink. That's all you want them to do. Be consistent with it. What does that mean? Tonight, they didn't do it, let them know so they can do it. Don't let, oh, well, mom will get it later. Uh-uh. Be consistent in whatever discipline that you're applying to your children and make sure you're doing it every single time. That's what I meant about not letting them get away with it. You can't. Certain times, you can. Here's the deal. If you're consistent, when you miss one of those times of being consistent, it isn't going to harm them. If you're inconsistent, if your discipline doesn't match up every single time, they're going to be so confused and they're going to be mad at you. Well, I didn't have to pick it up last time. Why do I have to do it now? Oh, anybody hear that one before? Be consistent. Start early. Realize your child is unique. Be, be consistent. And four, apply the rod of correction. Your children can be spanked. Your children Dare I say it? Your little ones need to be spanked. <laughs> and some of your teenagers need to be spanked. Okay, we won't go there. There is a time and a place where, it got to, where the girls got to an age, I stopped spanking them. But if you got tiny ones, they ain't there yet. Spank them on their behind. I want to encourage you to spank them on their But don't ever, I hate, don't pinch them. Please, don't pinch them. I know some people do that and don't. That's just my own personal opinion. I don't see in the Bible where it says, pinch a child and they will go. <laughs> I think God has created a, a perfect place, perfect target, if you will, cushioned, and uh, a belt will be fine. I don't want to, and I've, I've done it, I've hit, I spanked my kids with a belt, I spanked my kids with my hands. I prefer the belt, not because it's harm, more harmful, but I don't want that contact to be personal. But, but spank them. You know, timeouts, they work. Cool. Number five, very important, because this was a hard one for me and maybe a hard one for some of you. Stay calm and in control. You know they messed up, and you know that uh, if they could see the smoke coming out of their ears, it would be Coming out fast. Be cool. Calm. In control. And talk to them. Don't let them know that you're, if you're out of control. You're going to do something, say something that's going to cause more harm than the correction that you're applying. Are you with me? You cool? All right. Number five. No, I'm sorry, number six. This was real important to me. Have a productive attitude towards discipline. Every time, and I've said this before, I've said it several times, I'm going to keep on saying it until somebody gets it. Every time my children, I discipline them, send them to the room, spank them or send them to the room to discipline, whatever, every time after I gave them a chance to calm down and give me a chance to calm down, I went back in the room 
and I made it productive. I told them exactly what they, you'd be surprised how many times I'd, I'd ask them, do you know what you did wrong? And they got it, they didn't know. They got it wrong. They said, yeah, because you didn't want me to. No, that's not why you're being put in. More times than not, they had it confused. Every time I left their room, I told them I loved you. I, I corrected you, I spanked you, I disciplined you because I love you. And I want what's best for you. Every time. Every time. Then you're building that discipline into a productive direction. In the last one, number seven, a godly character is the goal. Why do we want to do these things? Because godly care, what you're doing is you're forming their character. You're teaching them how to be like Jesus and, and teaching them the importance of the Word of God, teaching them the importance of be, having a strong character and discipline. And the last thing, and I'll just finish with this, because this is what happens when we actually do this right. Spirit-filled parents will be filled with joy when our children and grandchildren follow Jesus. So important to be filled with that joy. 2 Timothy 3, 12 through 15, this is the New Century Version, verse 12. Everyone who wants to live as God desires in Christ Jesus will be hurt. Life's hard. There's going to be discouragement. There's going to be, oh, our society teaches us, no, that you shouldn't have to go through any pain. Nothing should ever be wrong in your life. That's a lie from the pit of hell. It is. Things are going, you're going to have disappointments. You're going to go through stuff. It's going to be hard at times. But look at 13. But people who are evil and cheat others will go from bad to worse. Teach them to stay away from those people that are causing trouble in their lives because it's going to cause so much trouble that they're going to miss out on the blessings of the Lord. They will fool others, but they will also be fooling themselves. Yeah, you know what? The easy way is to go out there and party and to do all that other kind of crazy stuff that some of us used to do. That's looking for self-gratification from wherever. It doesn't matter as long as I feel good. No. That's going to end up in disaster. That's going to end up in a life that's pretty messed up. Teach them to stay away from those guys and girls that cause trouble. But they're my friends. If they were really your friends, then bring them to church. Maybe God could save them. I'm not going to say anything more about that. But you should continue following the teachings you learn. You know they are true because you trust those who taught you. Make sure they're learning the Word of God. Make sure you're teaching them the Word of God. Make sure you're the best example of the Bible that they see in anyone else's life. You be the Word of God to them because you're living it out and you're teaching them. A lot of times you don't have to literally say the scripture to them, but the way you example the scripture has a powerful impact. In the last 115, since you were a child, you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise. Thank God that we can take our kids back there so, so uh, loving teachers can teach them the word, love on them and encourage them and show them God's word. They know it. It's amazing to me how some kids, they come in and they know the Bible so well. They're just taking it in. Thank God for our children's ministry. We should thank every teacher that we know that's back there. Since you are a child, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise, and that wisdom leads to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The most important thing is they're saved. They come to know Jesus, and their lives are settled for heaven. Amen? That's what we want. We want our kids in heaven with us. Amen? We want our grandchildren, and for some of us, our great-grandchildren. But thank God that we have the Bible to teach us how to be good, spirit-filled parents.
Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you for the word that you have given me to share. Now, Father, I pray for every family that's here, every individual family that has children and grandchildren. Lord, I pray that there would be a revival beginning in their families, a revival of the word, of the purposes of God, so that they can live out the word with joy and see the benefits of a powerful, awesome, working God that's changing lives, changing children, changing grandchildren, healing marriages, Lord. Pray for them now that their families would be transformed and they would be able to stand on your word and be an example to others around them. For the ones that are wayward right now, Father God, the ones that, the adult children that have lost their way, I pray that that through uh, your love and your power, you be bring them back. Bring them back, Lord. I pray for young couples that are struggling, that are confused on what's important. Lord, I pray those these young couples would know your will and be committed to your will above their own desire. For that will keep them in a place of stability and peace. And I also just pray for our children, thanking you for the teachers that influence them Sunday after Sunday, and for the love that the parents have for them. May it grow more and more and more. In Jesus' name, amen. If you don't know for sure that you're saved, if you're not sure, you're not sure that you believe in Jesus, why don't you come up here, not right now, but after everybody's moving around, going to their homes and lunch and stuff, come talk to me. God loves you and sent his son to be your savior. Amen? Next week we're going to talk about spirit-filled children, and it's going to be an awesome time. There's going to be some special things happening for moms. So moms, you want to be here. God bless you and have a blessed day.